What's up, listeners and supporters of the Ain't Hard to Tell podcast? We need some help from you, and it won't take up too much of your time. As we grow, we always want to hear your feedback, so take a minute or two to fill out a short anonymous survey. The survey link is right in the episode notes for this podcast. It's easy and takes less than five minutes. As always, we thank you for your continued support. to tell podcast episode 71 dexter henry brian fonseca taking you talking through everything going on in the world of sports hip-hop pop culture this is what we do here and today's episode we have a very special guest a very good friend of mine my latino sister from puerto rico national baseball writer for espn uh, again good friend of mine marley rivera yeah marley what's up What's up, kids? I'm uh, very disappointed that it took till episode 71 to join the Fonseca Henry party. So I appreciate uh, <laughs> I appreciate the invite. Finally, we, it's okay. 2019 is going to be a great year because I'm on. <laughs> well, you're going to be. Well, the second time is going to be in studio. Yes, we're going to have there in we studio. Go. We we're have, definitely going to make that happen. Yes. yes, we got Marley here on the phone, and she's been kind enough to to you know give us some time because we, we both are busy. Marley knows her and I. We both travel like crazy for work, so um, you know it happens. But Marley's here. Uh, Marley, for people, I, I've known you for I don't even how long have we known each other? Been like 10 maybe years. like maybe ten, 10 years? years, nine, ten years. Yeah, we know each other. Um, <laughs> Something like that. A long time. <laughs> I and I will say this to everybody here. I met Marley covering giants and jets and like nets and, yeah. and stuff and we met through there and mm. i sometimes give marley like rides back to the city from florin park yeah. to do that and we ended up talking and becoming like pretty good friends through that and uh marley mm. gave me the opportunity to do some video work with espn deportes international which was huge very helpful because that's the kind of great person that she is i just want people to know that um <laughs> But I know a lot about your career. I know you st- you started doing some stuff with uh, Spanish language TV before you got to do yeah. stuff for ESPN. Could you just tell the people who don't know, like, kind of how you got into uh, journalism? Well, I'm and sports old, sports? so in comparison to the two of you, <laughs> I've been doing this for a long time. So I started um, being a general assignment reporter. Um, I worked for actually for what used to be BAM, is what they called it, like MLB.com, and um, they used to run a couple of properties. Um, and what was known as BAM, actually that property has now belongs to ESPN now, and it's called BAM Tech. But at the time, it belonged to MLB. And, um, and I used to do, actually, they used to own also the properties for Major League Soccer. So I did a lot of writing um, and reporting for soccer. And um, that was like my wheelhouse, soccer and baseball. And that was about maybe 15 years ago, a little bit over that and um, probably a little more than that. And then I, I, I covered the U.S. national team, the soccer team, and at the same time I was covering baseball. And then I became a general assignment reporter. I worked for Univision uh, in New York City, and I did a couple more things like that. And then um, because I am an expert in baseball, and um, ESPN kind of recruited me, and I started on the Deportes side, just uh, writing in Spanish, but obviously because of the you know more than a quarter of baseball players being Spanish speakers of Latino descent uh, in Major League Baseball, then you know ESPN in English uh, started paying attention to what I was doing, and now I have this sort of hybrid job that I get the opportunity to work for both sides uh, of the company, writing and doing a little bit of television. So it's been um it's been quite a ride for a very long time, and it's been you know it's been very strange. Like I kind of was uh, diverging into just doing completely um just baseball when when you and I started hanging out but I still every once in a while I would still do a little Jets mm-hmm. and a little Giants but the Jets just kept breaking my heart so I just I can't <laughs> do it I can't <laughs> I can't be near the Jets anymore Dex I just can't do it I know well the, the Jets broke Brian's heart too because Brian was a Jet fan and then he just decided to leave the team he's like I can't do this anymore yeah yeah in 2014. that's it you gave up 2014 just, I had handed enough. it but I, I yeah 2014 I had enough but I just also don't <laughs> <laughs> I, I also just, you know, with sports fandoms in general, they can also get too too psychotic sometimes. And some oh, yeah. certain fans and other fan bases, as we've seen recently with certain NBA players, it can get highly oh, yeah. problematic in that way. And I just don't take my sports that way. You know what I mean? Like, it's just at that oh, point. Oh, no, I, I like, hear you. And I, and I think that's one of those things. And, you know, you guys know this because you're in the media and you cover – Sports, one of the things that happens, like, for example, me as a national baseball reporter, the first question I always get, I'm not kidding, is what team are you a fan of? Seriously? And I always reply immediately and I go, 
I have no fandom anymore. I actually say, what are you a fan of? And I go, time of game. That's what I'm a fan of. I actually want things to, uh, and then we always, we have a joke that we always root for the home team so you can play eight and a half innings, right? right. Like you don't have to play all nine. So then kind of, because your fanhood kind of gets diluted, right? And and it's a little bit unfortunate because you don't feel that little bit of a, of a twinge or, or, you know, like I, I grew up, like as a little kid, I grew up a Mets fan. And I, you know, when the Mets lost the World Series to the Kansas City Royals and we were just there, I mean, I had like no feelings about it. So it becomes, right, you become a little bit numb when you spend a lot of time in the media. Right. But but also, I would say that it sort of your fandom sort of evolves because then you start making connections yes. with certain players. And then, you know, you want to see them do well or you want to see certain people exactly. that you work around do well. Because I feel like I've gotten that where I cover one of the things I do as a freelancer, I cover the Nets with Nets daily. So I'm at a lot of Nets games doing stuff like that. And a lot of people think that because Nets Daily is sort of a fan blog mixed with a journalism site, it's weird to explain. But basically, <laughs> yeah, people think that I'm a Net fan just because I write at a site where there are a lot of Net fans writing about the Nets. And I hate that because they just assume that, oh, you're a Nets fan, so you got to rock with us on everything. And I'm like, nah, I'm pretty objective about this, and I'm kind of numb and don't really care about when certain things happen the way you do. Like, it's okay. It's cool. You know what I mean? Yeah, I actually had a little bit of a Twitter tiff, and I rarely say that because I tend to not engage. I I feel like, you know, but I had a little bit of a Twitter tiff because a couple of weeks ago, Mm -hmm. I tweeted something along the lines that I didn't believe that people who were fans, like real fans, right? Like you actually have just admitted that you don't have that anymore. But people who are true fans of a team, Mm -hmm. I really don't think that you can be objective and cover the team as a beat, right? Like if that's your job to cover one particular team. For example, I was a beat writer covering the New York, the New York Yankees for like six or seven years. Mm-hmm. And I feel like if you're a fan of the team, there are moments where you really have to be harsh, that you have to be, you know, you have to have journalism, journalism integrity. And it's just very hard when you're a fan. By definition, a fan is not objective. <laughs> Actually, yeah. you are completely subjective. And that's great. I mean, I love fanhood for other people, right? Like, it's fans are the ones who keep us employed. So that's fantastic. Like, fans are great, but I really just don't have it anymore. Yeah, no, no that's, a, that's, that's great points there. Marley, I always want to – I've talked to you many times about this. We've had conversations. But you, obviously, yeah. you being a, a woman in the industry and specifically a, Lati- <laughs> a Latino yeah. woman, right? And this will get into something else I have to ask you about, a tweet that you recently had. Um what has that experience been like for you over the years in watching that? And how many challenges are there still for women covering baseball? I think that the challenges are a lot different, right? Than when my mentor and uh, senior editor at uh, ESPN, Claire Smith, who's an African American woman mm-hmm. and is the only woman inducted into the Baseball Hall of Fame, um, and just happened two years ago. When Claire, you know, when Claire and Melissa Lutke, like these names that a lot of people know, got their, you know, the doors slammed in their face and were not allowed into clubhouses and so on. I have to say that doesn't happen anymore, right? Like it's not that blatant, but it's almost like, I don't know. Like I feel like, I mean, you're both men of color. Mm -hmm. So I want to tell you, like, it's almost like underlying and not in your face racism is almost worse. So, you know, I, I, no, like, I always you say almost, that. Well, you almost want it in your face. Yes, then that right. way you know how to handle it. Yes. In this way, it's kind of under the surface. And it's, and it's very difficult sometimes to deal with it. And being a Latina makes it even worse because, unfortunately, I'm going to try to be very kind here. Um, a lot of Latina reporters have developed just a very negative reputation in the business. And um, and it becomes about how you look and not about how you know, you know, how much, you know, mm-hmm. or what you do or the hard work that you put in. And that sometimes doesn't happen. You know, and, and you guys know this. It's really unfortunate, the images that we see on television of some of the Latino reporters. Yes. So I've also had to fight that. So it's not only fighting, right, the fact that I'm a woman in a, in a men's world. Um, but also trying to fight that. And when I started doing this job, you know, whatever, as I mentioned before, 15 years ago, um, there were no Latina baseball writers who also wrote in English, right? There's obviously Latina baseball writers who write in Spanish, but, um, you know, more mainstream in English, there were none. And uh, now I am like, I have the pleasure of having, you know, a couple of colleagues who are doing it now. So it's, it, there's been a slow development, but it's really taken a long time. Yeah, it definitely has. I wanted to talk to you about uh, a tweet you you had, and I texted you about this a couple weeks ago. Oh, yes. I, yes. Because, and I texted you. <laughs> yes. I, I texted me, too. <laughs> I saw it immediately, and I was like, yes, Marley, yes, yes, yes. So I'm going to read something so the viewers, and I'm going to put this up in our video version. 
But you tweeted, you said, saw a purported great baseball writer, who I think I might have an idea who you're talking about, <laughs> roll his eyes today as I was speaking in Spanish. Just when we think we've yeah. made strides, always get a nice reminder. I will continue to speak in Spanish to people slash players who also speak it. Don't like it, study and learn. And what I'll say to that is, Marley, <laughs> I have been in locker rooms with you, and I, tweet, I texted this to you. Many yes, times, did. many times over the years, I've been right next to you. I've helped shot video, yeah. I've shot interviews with you, and yeah. I have seen other people, non Latino reporters, and Brian to Brian and Sands, yes. um, roll their eyes when you've spoken to yes. certain players. I've seen this in NBA locker rooms. I've seen this in MLB. I've seen this a couple of times, and I always looked, thought about it and said, "What's up with that? Why are you mad?" And what I felt, Marley, is they were upset. Mad? Yeah. They, were, they were upset that you had a connection with these players based of your culture um, and language that they did, could not get close to them in the same way. I have always been an advocate in baseball that there needs to be more Latino reporters in the clubhouse. Yes. Because there are, would you, what were the percentages you said of those 25% of the players? Or 35% I said right now, I believe right now we are at 27%. Please 27%. Uh, don't, don't quote me, but I think those were the numbers uh, as of last year. So it's slightly over a quarter. I'm sorry, slightly over a quarter. And that doesn't include, and let's be very clear, it doesn't include the Brian Fonseca's of the world. Right. It doesn't include the guys who are, you know, of Latino heritage, right? right? Who were born in the United States because there's no way you can measure that, right? Mm -hmm. Like you can only do it by place of birth. So if you are, like, for example, in that list, they don't include an A-Rod or a Manny Machado Dylan or a Gio Gonzalez, right? right? Mm -hmm. Who are as Latino, Dylan Batanzas, mm -hmm. like guys who are as Latino as many others, but because they're born in the United States, it's just very difficult to quantify it. So, yes, um, I think around it's over a quarter of Major League Baseball. So it's over a quarter of Major League Baseball. Yeah. I, you put out that tweet, and I thought, and I said to you, I thought it was important that you tweeted that because I think <laughs> it's something that I've seen. But maybe if you're not a minority in that space or a, specifically a Latino in that space, you may not understand that kind of the look or a response that you may get yes. to that. How has that response made you feel over the years? And what was the feedback? You know what? Beside Kids, other people. You on guys it? are around this all the time. I have to tell you something. Most of the time, I ignore it. Mm -hmm. And I had my colleague, Buster Olney, actually text me that day. Because they know I never say stuff like that. Right? Mm -hmm. Like, I actually pride myself into my Twitter being sort of like a positive space. <laughs> like I never, like I was telling you before, I don't engage. I just don't really because there's enough hatred and, you know, negative feelings in the world. So I oh, do yeah. try. I fail many times, let's be very clear. But I do try often to keep it kind of positive. So obviously when I tweet something like that, my colleagues get very, you know, worried about it. And it's like, oh, Marley, are you okay? Is everything okay? And I said to Buster, you know what's funny? I'm just so surprised that this became such a big deal because it is so usual. It happens all the time. Mm -hmm. Like, this isn't something, it's just that I decided to call him out. Yeah. I decided to do it because I wanted, because that person, and I'm not keeping his name because I want to keep it secret or whatever. It's just right. because it's not about that. It's not about shaming one person, right? right? It's about you realizing of what you do, like the fact, and to be very clear, and I would tell you guys this, and no one, you know, no one needs to know, but I actually was not talking to a player. I was talking to a fellow reporter. Wow, that's, that's <laughs> interesting. Yeah, so wow. it's really, which I didn't even say. So a lot of people are like, well, you know, if you, you know, if you are talking to a player, maybe they're just upset that you guys are talking about something that they don't understand. And I was like, you know what? I don't have to explain this to you, but I was actually just talking to a fellow colleague. But and we were just chatting in Spanish. And it was just this, this, this look of disdain. And like you mentioned, Dexter, it happens yes. all the time, even when I'm doing it with players. So, uh, yep. you know what? I, I'm just, I just don't tweet it very often, kids, because what happens is I just get the tweets back saying, you're in America, speak English, oh my God. and it's just not uh, even worth it. It's not worth it. Yeah. It's not worth it. I just don't understand how people don't, and I, I'm not somebody who speaks um, – for, of another language, but from a different culture, yeah, I don't but, understand no, but, but here, not allowing people to be speaking the language they're comfortable speaking. But, I don't understand. But here, but here's the thing. But you, Dexter, you would understand that as a black reporter, if you're in an NBA locker room, mm -hmm. certain players are probably going to gravitate to you more than they're going to gravitate to some of the white teams that are in yeah. the locker room. Yes, you know. So I feel like it might have been a defensive thing where you know maybe somebody Marley in your case, maybe somebody thought that you were talking to a player and that they were bothered because oh you have a connection with that player that they don't have. Have. And because you know, reporting is such a cutthroat business, or this whole industry yes, is, is. A cutthroat business. Well, they can know, learn Spanish too, right? Agreed. And I'm saying yeah. that that pro that person probably felt you know whatever insecure, threatened, or whatever by Marley's position, mm -hmm. a relationship with the player, because that's the thing too. 
Like I don't. I don't, and that does I don't even happen. think it's just Let's a language thing. Well, you just, just mentioned does happen. Yes. Yeah. I don't even think it's just a language thing. I think it's also a connection thing too. I agree. But, I agree with that. But Mar- yeah, and, and one of the things I also, you know, I have uh, built a niche and a career for myself. Obviously, I have, you know, I mean, I'm going to toot my own horn and say that I'm a, you know, a pretty decent reporter of of all players, right? Like I cover right. everybody. I actually right. have a very close relationship with Ichiro Suzuki and who, you know, who actually speaks Spanish. But that's beside the point. The point being that, you know, but I do have a niche, and the reason why I started breaking news and becoming a well-known reporter was because of exactly what you just got. You guys just said the relationship that I developed with the players yes. led me to be a better reporter. And certainly there's a lot of jealousy that comes with that. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm definitely glad to hear you speak. How, on that. how long, cause I feel like it's different for everybody, but those players, are, mm-hmm. those relationships with players, because obviously, you know, I'm, I'm on the younger side. I'm 25, and I've been doing this. For you a guys few. are children, right? I've been, <laughs> I don't know if I'm a child. I've been, but okay. I've been doing this for a few years now, and I wonder, like, how long does that sort of take those relationships to cultivate and things like that? Just from a you know what, Brian? Standpoint? I have to say, it's it depends on the case, the case by case basis. But if I have to give you an average to actually give you an answer, because I hate when people go, "Oh, it depends on the case." Yeah, it, just give me a freaking answer. I understand. The so, um, I would have to say that at least two seasons. Two or mm. three seasons, minimum. Mm. So they see you, they know they start trusting you. And the problem, especially in baseball, when you have a 40-man roster that changes all the time, yeah. is that you sometimes don't have that luxury of time. Mm. So, And as you well know, in the NBA, it's even worse, right? Because there's only five guys. You're just doing, you know, I mean, obviously the extended uh, team is a lot bigger, but just, you know, you're starting five. Yeah. So you have less opportunities to develop that connection. And baseball has the advantage of that we get a lot more time with the players. And in the NBA, you don't. So actually building that relationship that take, I would say about two seasons with some players, it's immediate, obviously, because I mean, especially with Puerto Rican players, because mm-hmm. we have such a, such a connection in a background and there's only 19 of them. So then that's really easy, right? Because we, we can speak the same language and I'm not talking about Spanish. I'm talking about like Puerto Rican, you know, yeah, like yeah. we have this background, <laughs> but with all the other guys, it's really it's really a case by case basis, and some of them are just really, really tough nuts to crack. And to this day, um, they're still kind of don't trust me even ten years later. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I feel like it sort of varies because, like, with, with me, for example, like with, when covering the Nets, I'm not on the road with the team. Obviously, I can't afford that. You know what I mean? My outlet's yeah. not gonna, my outlet's not gonna put the budget uh-huh. out there. So I just do a lot of different things. Like I'll do high school basketball, college basketball, pro basketball. Excellent. I've done WNBA, boxing, MMA. I've even done some Met games before. You know what I mean? So it's just a whole bunch of different things. So I'm wondering on that end, because it's a little bit different. It's not like I'm in the same locker room every single day, if that makes sense. I'm I have to tell you, spaces. yeah, that definitely is going to be a factor. And one of the things, right, that really, because when I was doing a general assignment reporter, like Dex was talking about, still mm-hmm. doing a little bit of NFL, still doing a little NBA. Dex and I did some Mets games, some, you know, we did some Knicks games. So we, we, Dex and I used to cover kind of everything that was available. I think we even did soccer, right, yep. Dex? Yeah, we did. Like you did a little soccer with me. So it's like when you are so jack of all traits, master of none, mm-hmm. it can, and I'm not saying that in a negative way. Let's be very clear. No, no, I think no. a jack of all traits in sports is you know, <laughs> it's a very good thing. Yeah. But um, to be a jack of all traits, sometimes you just can't do those connections. You can't specialize. And one of the things that really helped me to develop my connections, especially, you know, in the Yankees clubhouse was the fact that I was on the road with them mm-hmm. because at home, and you guys are both members of the New York media, yeah. the New York media is massive. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And not only that, they have the luxury of having a second, a second clubhouse guys. Like when you go to Yankee stadium, they have an entire second clubhouse that they can hang out in. Like they don't have to be outside yeah. right with you. And the same thing happens, as you guys know, with the Nets and the Knicks. They have so much space where they can hide. On the road, there's no space. Mm. On the road, they're in the same space with you all the time. And I do think that, and especially like a little bit of advice to reporters out there, if you're investing in your career, right, and let's say, for example, and I'm just going to use the Yankees. Actually, let's use the Mets as an example. Mm. And you really want to, you know, develop relationships and so on. Start investing in short little trips. Go to Philly. Go to those things because in New York, it's just very, very hard unless you've been doing it for a long time. I'm actually, so try to take out of your pocket and yeah. go to like short little trips. It doesn't have to be, you don't have to go to Seattle. 
Right. <laughs> right? Although, although but try I, going to the East Coast or, you know, to, but then don't go to big cities. Like, don't do it in L.A. Don't do it in Chicago. Don't do it in Miami. Right. Those are all places where there's a lot of media. But in smaller media markets, it's really, really different the way you cover a team. I'm actually thinking about heading to Las Vegas for NBA Summer League. Just to but you know that's going to be super crowded. Summer league is like people. nuts. Yeah, it's nuts. Yeah. It's lots of fun, but it's nuts. <laughs> no, I, I, well, I don't care about the fun aspect. I've just heard from <laughs> other people that I've trusted good that have, that have got. Yeah, I've heard that it's good for that sort of thing. It's a good experience. Oh, great! To be out there. Yeah, yeah, excellent. So I'm thinking about doing it like that because I don't drink, I don't gamble, I don't do any of that stuff. So I'm not, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not the person that's like, yo, I got to get to Vegas. I, I don't care. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> I was gonna say, I was my response to that was gonna be, um, I don't gamble. <laughs> <laughs> Marley, I know that. I know that. Uh, Mar- Marley, I'm a baseball writer, dude. I, I think you got, half you of got, my yeah, you got, you, right. yeah, you got, you got to get some drinks in when you can. I understand that being on the road. <laughs> Marley, you, you have brought up soccer, and I meant to tell you, I did an interview the other day with uh, Claudio Reyna. He says hello. He remembered us. Me, oh my He God. remembered me from doing some stuff with you, and he was like, "How's Marley?" And I was like, "You know, guys, Good. just wait, because the two of you are so young, right? And and Brian, it's going to happen to you. I feel and, and I was." Just chatting with uh you know with one of my really good friends maureen mullen who is a, a general sports reporter in boston and mostly covers about the patriots and the red sox and we were chatting today and i've been talking to a lot of the ladies right because we're a little bit of a you know of a sisterhood um yes. in sports we really care for each other yeah and um and we build each other up it doesn't matter what sport you cover right like it's you know we we, we really build each other up and i'm chatting with her and we realize that there are 12 managers right now in major league baseball that we covered as players. Wow. <laughs> so then you start getting a little bit older. So just wait when that stuff starts happening. Oh, then you God. start realizing you're like, shoot. So Dexter just, you know, a little blast from the past. Yes. Dexter and I covered a guy named Juan Carlos Osorio, who mm-hmm. was the manager for the, the manager, the technical, <laughs> the DT is what they call it in Spanish, of, um, of the New York Red Bulls, right? Yep. Like a very, very long time ago. Yep. The guy became the national, the Mexican team manager manager like it's yep. you know like it's like one of the biggest jobs in the world so it's kind of interesting when you see people that you know that you see them on the way down and then you you know i'm sorry you see them when you're at the bottom with all of them and then you see them on the way up and it's pretty fun you you know you have these connections that you've developed through time and and i know you guys are going to do it too and brian you're going to do it it's, it'll, it'll be you know you guys sound charming so it's going to be easy yeah, yeah, definitely. He is going to do it. Marley, want to actually let's get into a little bit of baseball. Um this Please. this off season, right, was kind of I think interesting in terms of the way money was spent and how long it took oh. for some of the big names to or get signed. Or it wasn't. Or it wasn't spent. Or, yes, yeah. true. Good point. Yeah. Were you shocked yeah. at how long it took for guys like Machado and Harper to get deals when we saw them get as, get them as late as they did? Absolutely. And I am shocked that people like Dallas Keuchel you know, which is a starting pitcher, World Series winner with the, you know, Houston Astros at the time. And obviously the, the starter for the All-Star game and someone, you know, a future Hall of Famer like Fred Timbrell, closer for the Boston Red Sox and winner of a, of a World Series ring last year, still don't have a job. So absolutely, you know, I've been beyond shots. There's still about 30, I think we counted them the other day, 27 or 30 viable major league players in their early 30s. The fact that Adam Jones, Yep. Who is you know who is in early thirties and has one of the biggest cannon arms in baseball, right. and that he didn't get a job and had to get three million dollars from you know from the Arizona Diamondbacks and an invite to, to you know with a minor league contract and an invite to spring training. The fact that Gio Gonzalez just made three million dollars with the New York Yankees, a guy who in the last eleven seasons is one of the guys who has been most durable, you know, almost 30 starts, yep. you know, almost every single freaking year. Mm-hmm. It's, it's actually shameful. Those are the words that we're using. And it's just, it's a monopoly, you know, it's not, it's, it's a collusion, even though they don't admit it. And mm. the managers, and I'm sorry, not the managers, but I'll take managers. them out. I have nothing to do with this ownership mm-hmm. and, mm-hmm. you know, and general managers and so on. I mean, they know that they can do the same thing for cheap. And today, the reason why obviously we are on right now I was, um, I was driving from Fort Myers. I'm, I'm in uh, Grapefruit League in Florida covering baseball. And I was at Chris Sale. He had his press conference, um, and he just got extended by the Red Sox with a five, five-year, $145 million contract. Mm-hmm. And one of the things that Chris said on the stage, which I loved, right up there he said, what the Red Sox are doing inspires everybody because half of the league is not trying to win. Yeah. And that is just, you know, so there are at least, so let's just say 15 out of the 30 teams have no chance, and they're just not willing to spend. 
And it's, it's just completely shameful. Now, these guys, like, gift the $430 million to Mike Trout, gift the $300 million to Manny Machado, and the three hundred million to Bryce Harper, because these kids deserve it, mm-hmm. right? But also give the contracts to the other people. Like, How? it's just, it's, it's really, actually, it saddens me you that said- they don't understand, you know, that everything is measured only on advanced metrics and only on analytics, and your contributions in the clubhouse are not measured. How and, much, you know, the kind of player that you are is not measured in numbers. How much of a problem do you think this is for baseball going forward, Marley? I'm not sure when the next CBA is for baseball. It's a couple years away, it's right? It's 2021, yeah. The 20, so next CBA is 2021. I don't think that it's going to be a problem because look at the amount of extensions that everyone is signing. So the players are freaking out, right? Mm. Like That's exactly what happened. We saw it with, you know, players of the caliber of – I don't know, Luis Severino, pitcher for the Yankees, mm-hmm. Aaron Nola, uh, star pitcher for the Phillies, and all these kids, because it's different for Chris Sale, right? Chris Sale got a really good deal. He's an older, you know, not an older player. He's about the same, the same age. But he is someone who already had a millionaire contract, and he's just getting an extension, and it's adding. But, you know, all these young kids, look at what Alex Bregman just did. Yep. You know, before free agency, I mean, you know, we saw it with Eloy, you know, in the White Sox. It's the same thing. So I don't know if that's going to be a problem, Dex, because it seems like they're all freaking out and they're just already signing extensions. That, yeah, that's what we're seeing. Do you think there's something to – because I feel like other leagues are going to start trying to do what the NBA did because they were having some of these issues earlier, but now you're starting to see players yes. get rewarded and have big contracts. I think that baseball players are starting to see like, oh – Athletes do have some power here, and this isn't all about advanced metrics. This is about, as you said, what we could contribute in the clubhouse and other things like that. Do you feel like baseball is going to start to, you know, that that's going to really start to pick up in terms of the athletes recognizing that? And I don't know. I don't know. I actually, I wish that I could say yes and be hopeful about it. I think one of the things that is really, and I know I'm going to sound so super counterintuitive hmm. in what I'm going to say. But one of the things that is really going to help baseball in a weird way and help players will probably be the legalization of sports gambling. Because I do think that baseball is one of the sports that could really, really benefit from this, you know, because of the pace of the game, the amount of things that you could bet on. And I think it's going to make baseball more popular. And then by default, it will bring in more money. And then the players could benefit from that money. But I don't know that there's anything else you can do. First of all, the MLBPA, the Players Union, is the strongest union in yes. sports. Yes. There's yes. no competition from Not the NFL else. or the NBA. Right. If they haven't been able to fix it, I mean, they signed a bad, a bad CBA. They did. You know, their yeah, collective no bargaining doubt. agreement is a bad one. So yeah. then now they got to go. They traded little favors and days off and, you know, the, yeah, I don't know, bringing up games, you know, on, on Sundays and having extra days off and so on. For things that really mattered, like making money, yeah. so it's going to be uh, it's going to be tough. And obviously, in a league that has no salary cap, it's also a little bit different. Different there. What? Who did you think made maybe the biggest improvement of any teams this off season? Like who? Who? who oh, do you think by really... far the Phillies. The I don't Phillies, think right? that. Uh, I think the addition of Bryce Harper is incredible. I think the fact that I think Bryce Harper is going to thrive in Philadelphia, especially with a really really short right field porch. Right? It's like when you bring someone. Of that caliber, if he stays healthy, right, let's be very clear. It has to be, you know, it has to be health. Yeah. There's so much talent in that team. There's a lot of really young players that haven't broken out. For example, Michael Franco or Otubel Herrera, mm-hmm. an outfielder and third baseman. Like, these guys are still yet to break out, and they have great pitching. Just very talented. E.J. Carriera, as I mentioned before, Aranola. And I think this is a team that really, uh, they traded for Gene Segura. Like, there are things that they've done that I do think they won the offseason really well, and the St. Louis Cardinals, too, with uh, with signing Paul Goldschmidt at a ridiculous deal, uh, <laughs> one of the best players in baseball. Yeah, that, that, that was crazy. Who did, who would, did you, what team did you think didn't do as well as they should have this offseason? It was a disappointment. Uh, the Boston Red Sox, just because, and I'm only going to say that, just because they need help in the bullpen, mm. and they lost their two key arms, and the reason why they have a World Series ring in Craig Kimbrell and Joe Kelly, yep. and the fact that they don't have those guys anymore, and that right now they're doing like a bullpen with closers by committee, mm-hmm. it's really just kind of uh, interesting because I think that's going to be the edge in this division that it's, you guys know that's only between the Yankees and the Red Sox. Like, that's it. Yeah. So then I think that the Yankees are going to take that edge, except that the Yankees are super injured. Right. So then I don't think they did enough. And neither did the Cleveland Indians, because the Cleveland Indians feel that, you know, that division is kind of handed to them. 
Like, I love what Minnesota Twins did because they're really trying. But if you look, and people who are not baseball fans out there, if you look at the AL Central, the American League Central, which is where the, where the Cleveland Indians play, mm-hmm. uh, for this, I know you guys know this, but yeah. just for everybody else, every other team, there's five teams there, four out of the five are reconstruction. Yep. Yeah. Our teams that are not competing. And the Los Angeles Dodgers also didn't do enough. You know, they're going to be, you know, they're, they need some more pitching. They need, and now we see Clayton Kershaw starting the season on the, on the injured list. So, I mean, years. this is going to be a difficult year. So, I think between the Dodgers uh, not adding enough, the Cleveland Indians, and the Boston Red Sox. Those are my picks. One team we haven't talked much of, uh, the Mets. I'm wondering, what, oh. uh, <laughs> what was your thought? First of all, I was excited that Edwin Diaz came over for obvious reasons. Oh, God. Pretty fun. <laughs> Puerto Rico. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, sugar, sugar is what we call him. Yeah. Yeah. So, what your thoughts on just their moves, you know, getting Cano, getting Diaz. You know what? They're prospects. interesting. Yeah. That's what I like. Marley, about. I don't like that. I don't, I don't like that. Marley. They're I don't, interesting. I, I don't I like mean, interesting. Come on, yeah. How do you not it's, like it's, interesting? You're I want, a reporter. I want better than interesting. <laughs> That's not exciting, Dex, I agree with you. I just <laughs> don't think that they're going I, – I think they're a better team now. Absolutely. I how think mu- we can all agree much, with that. How much better, Marley? Because they have so many problems in that outfield, mm. and I just really – you know, with the continuous injury. And the thing with the Mets, as you guys know, I don't have to tell you, yeah. is the fact that the question of health is so important, right? Every because year. they – reside on those arms of Noah Syndergaard and of Jacob the Grom and, you know, like these guys, they really matter. And the bullpen is so iffy. Right, like you don't really outside of Juris Familia and Edwin Diaz, mm-hmm. what do you do in middle relief? So I think that that's kind of one of those things that it's getting a little tricky. But you know what? I love that Robinson Cano is back in New York. That's pretty fun, and um, and the fact that I mean, I, and I like the. I know that a lot of people are criticizing the Brody move, but you know what? Try something new. I'm, I'm all for trying something new. Agreed. And um, and I know the Mets have been the butt of a lot of jokes but they're always fun to be around. I don't know. I'm excited about seeing them, and I haven't said that since 2015. Oh, right. Okay. I'll, Good I'll omen t- because they got to the World Series that year. Yeah. <laughs> ah, there you go. I was trying to throw I'll, a little nugget I'll there, t- and they so, knew it. So do, uh, I'll ask you this, Marley. Do you think they can compete in that division? Obviously, I think you probably have the Phillies at the top. Oh, yes. But yeah. you think they can compete? I think, I, think, um, I think they can compete, certainly. Absolutely. I think that – they can compete. I do think that it's going to be between Atlanta and Philadelphia, yes. right, just because of pure talent. Atlanta doesn't have enough pitching, and I think the Mets, if the Mets pitching stays healthy, mm-hmm. I do think the Mets take that wild card. Absolutely. Okay. But, they, um, they, but they have to stay healthy. It's really, really difficult for them to stay healthy, guys. So then that's the problem, right? I did like that Josh Donaldson signing for Atlanta, though. I, come on. It's awesome. And Josh Donaldson is playing with a chip on his shoulder, right? Yeah, like, I've yes. known Josh since he was – you know, in Oakland when he was obviously an MVP. And, like, this guy has so much talent, but he has to stay healthy. Yep. That's another one, right? Like, it's just an unhealthy Josh Nelson doesn't help anybody. Who's a team that you think people should keep their eye on this season? Maybe a sleeper in either league, American National League. A little sleeper. I like Minnesota. Mm. I think that what the Twins have done, there's, like, little moves that I really kind of – the fact that they signed Nelson Cruz, I think Nelson yes. Cruz is going to kill it as a DH in the AL Central. Mm. I think, I mean, I, I would, he would be, if, if Aaron Judge wasn't in the Yankees, he would be my pick of like home run leader mm. because in the AL Center, he's really going to kill it. So I think that's like a really sleeper team. They did some improvements in the rotation. Michael Pineda, former Yankee, is now healthy right. from his Tommy John surgery. They got, they signed Martin Perez. I feel like they can, they can get sneaky, you know, and they have a really, really good team. Jonathan Scope is now, you know, former Oriole playing second base. I think that. It's going to be fun to watch, and the Indians better watch out, you know, for for the Minnesota Twins. Okay. How do you feel about some of the because we saw some of the proposed like rule changes that maybe they were trying to test out and things like that? How do you feel about some of these and like baseball? Trying well, to... some of them are already implemented, right? Yeah. So now it's going to be the pitching, you know, the rule of the minimum three batter minimum, and and obviously the pitch clock and the mound bit has been reduced, you know, from six to five. There's quite a few, not very drastic ones. But obviously, the drastic ones that people are keeping an eye on are the ones that are implemented right now in the Atlantic League, and they're going to try it, right, before, you know, Major League Baseball is, you know, testing things out. And the main one is obviously the robot, <laughs> the robot on fire uh, doing a strike zone. So um, with those changes that are now, I think they're just very light. There isn't anything too dramatic except the three batter minimum, right? Like, that's going to be really interesting and may 
right? It's not going to completely remove the lefty specialist from the game, but it's going to challenge it. So I think that um, especially middle relief, which uh, for people out there, it just means that you pitch between the fifth and the seventh inning. Like for those guys who, who are middle relievers, it's going to be interesting to see how that role changes, the fact that you have to pitch up to three batters. But I think for now, that's the only one that's really dramatic. Now, the robot umpires seem to be in the, in the horizon. <laughs> we'll see how that goes. Are you, are you a fan of that, potentially going to the robot umpire? No. You're not Absolutely a fan not. of that. Me neither. No. Me neither. I find the robot umpires interesting, at least. Kind of like but you don't like <laughs> you don't like interesting. I, I know I don't. <laughs> you know what it, you know you know what it is. I, I don't. I mean, if we can get it right, I don't know. I gotta see. I don't know. I don't know. I have to believe. Yeah. I'm kind of mixed on it. I think there are changes that really help, right? Like as you guys will know now with something called VAR, which yes. is what they do in soccer, mm-hmm. right? In order to see whether the ball crossed a particular line and it's scored or not, and we see how it is in tennis with the challenges. I do think that baseball could improve in terms of, you know, challenges and replays and things being a little faster. And I do think that's kind of where they want to go. They want things to be a little faster in terms of balls and strikes. But come on, don't take my umpires away. Come on, yeah. how are we going to have a really good umpire fight if I someone know. gets tossed yeah. out of the game? That's It'll never point. happen. That's a good point. That is a good point. Marley, before we let you out of here, um, real quick question since we have you here for Women's History Month and women in journalism. You, you sounded pretty optimistic at the beginning of this conversation about where things are going for women and I think minorities so. in journalism. Like how optimistic are you for the future and you sort of being one of these, well, I say a modern trailblazer uh, of women in, <laughs> in journalism. You are. You really are. But, uh, yeah, how opti- but it's, uh, first of all, I'm very thankful for you saying that. Oh, yeah, well, <laughs> Well, yeah, but you but you feel very optimistic about the future in that regard, correct? I do. Absolutely. I really do. And I do think that we need more Af- African-American women. I feel like we really are missing uh, black women who are sports writers. Mm. So we really need some more. Actually, right now in Major League Baseball, there are zero uh, wow. <laughs> African-American. Uh, there's only three Latinas, including me. So I'm not saying that it's a, you know, but women of color. I think that we're supporting each other. And the problem is because we haven't gotten, we've gotten the door slammed in our face so often that, you know, you find the window to sneak in and then you throw out a towel or you throw out a a blanket and you pull up the other people, right? So as long as women, you know, as long as women help each other and we have men that are supportive like you guys for having me, you know, on your podcast and like things like that. Like, I do think that if we continue to support each other, it will happen. You can see it, right? Like you can really see it. There used to be only one woman who covered the New York Yankees as a beat, and now there's like five of them. So it's really, you know, it really has been a slow progression, but I am super optimistic that if women continue supporting each other, because unfortunately, you know, there's room for all of us. Like it isn't, you know, this isn't a, we don't compete against each other. You should just only compete against yourself all the time, right? Like you should always compete to be a better journalist every day. And don't be afraid that someone's going to take, there's, there's, there's room in the table for all of us. There Amen. really is. It's it's one of those things. Like it's there's there's plenty of room. There's plenty of players. There's plenty of money. There's plenty of sports. Like we can all do this. And and it, I I do feel very very optimistic that that more women of color. Right. There's plenty of women who are not women of color, but that more women of color will get interested in in real journalism covering sports. So hopefully uh, it happens. And I am hopeful. I think it will happen. Yeah, well, it, a lot a lot of it started with you. Marley, thank you for joining us <laughs> yes. here on A Hotel Pockets. I'm sorry it took two years, but it will not take two years to get you in studio. Episode 71, award-winning. <laughs> yes, yes, award-winning episode <laughs> with the great national baseball writer for ESPN, <laughs> Marley Rivera. Thank you again, sister. Appreciate you so much. Oh, it's been such an honor. Mr. Fonseca and Mr. Henry, I am so, um, so happy that you guys have me on. And, you know, and to your audience, I'm sorry that I'm not cool like them because, you know, they talk, <laughs> you know, the intersection of culture and sports and, you know, cool urban things. I am so boring. All I know is No, you're not. <laughs> you're, you're, you're far from boring. Well, we're looking forward to having you in studio very soon. Very soon. We'll t- oh, absolutely. Thank you so much for having me, guys. Gracias. No problem. All right. Take care, Molly. Be good. A new daily fantasy app for prop bets is here, and it's called Thrive Fantasy. Forget the old school way of DFS. Thrive Fantasy has streamlined the drafting process and eliminated the need to do unnecessary hours of research by using only top tier athletes. That means no more salary cap. You just build your lineup around a list of prop bets. Here's how it works. For each contest, you choose 10 of the 20 prop bets 
plus two ice picks that protect you from any late scratches or postponed games. Each unique prop has an over and under point value assigned to it, and you will be rewarded that value if the prop is correct. So for example, if Tom Brady throws for over or under 250 yards, the less likely the prop is to occur, the more points the choice will be worth. You build your team, score around the amount of correct prop bets you select. It's easy to play, so just check out the Thrive Fantasy link in the description of this podcast and get in the game with Thrive Fantasy today. All right, so great talk with Marley Rivera of ESPN. A lot of good stuff she hit on, man. I can't wait till she's up here. And t- yeah, me either. Woo! And talking about the financials and things going on in baseball, CBA coming up in 2021. Yeah. That stuff was really interesting, just the economics of it, and then just, you know, what she thought about the different teams making different moves. Like, what'd you, it was good that you got to talk to a fellow Puerto Rican journalist. There are not many here. of us, I'm telling you. I know. Like, there so, are really not many of us. That's what I'm saying. Like, this, I tell people this thing is a fight. Every single day. <laughs> this thing is a fight all the time. Like I know people joke that, oh, you like, you know, fighting, you like violence, you do, MMA, you do. boxing, and all but that you stuff. Do. But like my entire life is a fight every single day. That sounds you know like what, I mean? that sounds like what everybody your height says. <laughs> but it is. The, it is. It, it, the, the you know what sh- struggle this is why people. this is why I rock with Isaiah Thomas. Yes. You know what I'm saying? This is why I was I was sad for him when Boston traded him, even though I understood it from a business standpoint. You had to stand you had to stand with your short brethren. Yes. That's what you have to do. One hundred percent. Yeah, man. But we we will absolutely have uh, Marley Rivera up here in studio yeah. to come and kick it with us and talk some more. Um, it was really good. One of our uh, really good interviews that we've had. Yeah. Um, as I said before, really uh, good friend. And you know, a lot and, of stuff. And with people her who and listen to this, people who listen to this, they know I don't like phoners. And unless we can do something that's super timely and somebody who we really, really, really like, like right. then, you know, like we had Christy Ackert on during the offseason. Yes, she another, come another in. great woman baseball writer right. we've had on. We had her on during the offseason. She couldn't come in because obviously, you know. The she was Mets. dealing with the Canelo. Uh, Canelo, excuse me. <laughs> 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 we talked about Canelo in, a, in another discussion. <laughs> yeah. that, 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 that'll that come up. Um, yeah. But we, we had her. She couldn't come on because of the trade that the right. Mets had. And we'll had have her on Canelo. soon as well, hopefully. Yeah. Uh, now that she's, I think, covering the Yankees. She's the Yankees beat writer. She transferred over from the mess of the Yankees, yeah. Uh, but, yeah, like, those sort of things. But the phoners are rare. But when they do happen, just know, like, there's a reason why there's an exclusive amount of people, not many, who are allowed to do phoners. Phoners. (laughs) Yeah, we generally like to have the people come up here and actually pick it with us. Yeah, we're not in Montana. We're in New York. Like, people are going to come up here. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, so so hopefully, um, we have some other good people to close out Women's History Month, uh, before it is done, still working on finalizing a few things with some people, but yeah. the, those should happen. Um, and if it doesn't happen and we're not able to get them for Women's History Month, they're still going to come on anyway. We'll so get them. Um, there's a couple of people that definitely are going to come through, uh, including some people who have been on here before that will return. So good talk with Marley Rivera. Uh, yes. I hope that you guys were able to enjoy that. Um, I know people wanted to see uh, more women reporters and people doing stuff with, with baseball. We'll be talking baseball as the, as the year goes on and different things around that. So uh, good job in episode 71. Uh, 71, it is time for the numbers. Uh, as Brian has told me, we are now into the land and range of linemen, yeah. uh, specifically offensive linemen. Um, no, I would well, say I would some say defensive linemen. Yeah, too. I would say from from what I've gathered in terms of research, there were more good defensive linemen in the seventies than they were in the sixties. Sixties, okay. Where in the sixties, you know, you had some great offensive linemen. We had Kevin Mawai, yep, DeBrickishaw Ferguson, others whose names are escaping me. We once had Melo and Tracy McGrady because of their career highs. Because sixty two, I think it was that number yes. was so bad, um, and things like that. But for seventy one, we actually have some good. Uh, Not some bad. Good Not yeah. bad. We got Walter Jones. Okay. NFL, yep. Uh, NFL lineman for a long time, and Jason Peters, another NFL, NFL lineman, lineman for a long yep. time, and Trent Williams, another NFL mm-hmm. lineman for a long time. Yep. <laughs> and Tony Baselli, who has an interesting uh, sort of friendly feud with Dan Levitard that I find very entertaining. Did not know that. Yeah. Don't you have to? They, look they, that up. He he comes on the show and they just yell at each other about dumb stuff. You sound like you would like that. Oh, it's great. Yeah, I'm sure you it's would. It's great. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Rod Woodson, one of my favorite NFL players ever. Seventy-one career interceptions. Yes, I don't, that I, is a lot. I'm not usually for the like achievement marks, but that's a lot. And this dude was great. That's I think that's third all time. I'm checking it right now. Just who's to be, yes, third. Who's number one all time in interceptions? Paul Krause. Okay, and then M. M-, M- Emlyn Tunnel. I hope it's not Tunnel. Where is where is um Ed Reed? 
oh, he's up there. We passed him. If I yeah. wish I remember it, it's yeah. 64. Something I don't know like who that. we have for yeah. 64. One of my favorites, too. Ed Reed has 64. Yep. Damn, that's a lot. When I was younger, I remember I used to think like 30 interceptions is a lot. And I'm not saying that it's not a lot because that's still like. It's a good amount for your career. Yeah, it's like you've been in the league for a while. Yep. Like, you know, if you play 10 years, you get three interceptions a year. I mean, that's 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 mm. solid cornerback. Yep. But I'm looking at the list. I'm like, God damn. You know, Paul Krause played, oh, for those of you who don't know, in the 60s and 70s. So he had a 15, 16-year career, played for a couple teams. Uh, you have, like, Night Train Lane that's up here. Charles Woodson was actually Woodson. 65. Mm-hmm. Ed Reed, 64. And then you keep going down, you'll see, like, Darren Sharpers in the 60s, Mel Blount's in the, uh, in the 50s, Aninas Williams, who I remember – he used to kill me in Madden 04, bro. <laughs> oh, my God. And you like, I hate him. I hate him in Madden 04. Because that was like his last season, and he yep. used to kill me. Nah, he's a beast. I he could not beast. throw to him. He was a beast, man. And then you have other great corners like Revis who are not don't have that many interceptions because they're not thrown to I a mean, lot. it's hard with the corners. And, and I mean, it's hard for the corners. that The corners that do have a high amount of interceptions, you know, with safeties, you have probably more opportunities. Revis, 27. Um, that's I mean, still, no, 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 29. That's still Sweet. great for a corner who did not get thrown to for, like, a, a good amount of his career. And this is not my University of Pittsburgh bias coming through, but, yes, that he, he Revis is one of the all-time great. Interesting players. that he has the same amount of interceptions as Eric Weddle. And huh. then you have Dominique Rogers cromarty has 30. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, it just varies. It's yeah, just, it's, it's, see, this is why, like, back in the day, people would measure defensive play by steals and blocks in the NBA mm-hmm. and then measure it by interceptions and tackles and stuff like that in football. Now – this is why advanced metrics are good sometimes where it's like you can measure, you know, how often they're actually thrown to. Yep. Now we have deflections. Deflections. You know right? what things I mean? Like that, we have defensive box plus minus and things like yep. that, which, you know, plus minus isn't perfect, but you have, you know, other things, things to measure that. you can look at it for. All uh, right. And then we have anyone else with 71? Yes, uh, we have. Benji Malkin. Yes. From the uh, Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh Penguins. Yes. Yes. I almost said Steelers. <laughs> yeah, I was like, no, he did not play. He's not playing for the Steelers. You can tell we don't talk a lot of hockey on this podcast. Dexter's black. I'm Puerto Rican. They're actually more of y'all <laughs> than they are of us. Hey, hockey. but we did have a hockey person make it. We did. We did Mario Lemieux. Remember? We yeah, yeah, the yeah. One episode. Mario, we Mario Lemieux. Lemieux. Listen, yeah. at 99, you think we're not going Wayne Gretzky? You know, pro- you, you know exactly what time it is for 99. <laughs> listen, 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 listen. And, and, and there's one coming up. That look seventy look. 70, oh, okay, yes, I know. Seventy six, seventy seven are gonna be real interesting. Well, you know where I'm going, seventy seven. Uh, yeah, but yeah. like you might have to also rep for seventy seven. I understand. I understand so where you're going. We might have that. to go too. But anyway, um, I like Rod Woodson, man. I was going with Rod Woodson too. It's a Rod <laughs> Woodson episode. That yeah. is it. Episode seventy one, a Hartel podcast. Uh, we uh, thank you to our guest Marley Rivera, a national baseball writer for ESPN, ESPN Deportes. We really got to thank her for joining. Us again. Uh, thank you to our producer, Raul, did a great job today. Yes. Um, also, thank you to all of you guys, listeners, viewers. Continue to support us. Please leave comments wherever you listen to the podcast, whether it's Spotify, uh, iTunes, Apple Podcasts, however you listen, please leave your comments. That definitely helps us. Uh, if you haven't subscribed, I just found a friend the other day who told me, why aren't my podcasts still loading? I haven't seen a new one. I'm like, she found out, yo, I didn't realize I wasn't subscribed. Subscribe so you can know the latest podcast coming up. We got a lot more content coming for you. Also, be sure to support us on Patreon. All the ways to support you, we thank you guys. We appreciate you guys. For Episode 71, where Brian still loves violence, as he does on every episode. Uh, for Brian Fonseca, I'm Dex Henry. Until next time, y'all. Peace. Shout out to Francisco Lindor just because. <laughs> Puerto Rico. <laughs>